All right, let's get started, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so I have a few announcements. Um, homework uh, four is out, and we decided to give you um, two extra days on the homework. Um, we're running a little bit behind on lectures, and I wanted to make sure you had extra time to work on the homework. So it's due Saturday night. Um, uh, submit on um, Friday the 25th for the bonus point. Um, project one is out. You're going to work on project. Uh, so the project is we'll have three court projects in this course. And this is a chance to um, work on uh, with some data in a um, larger uh, case study. Um, so you'll work through some um, some real world data and apply the techniques you've been learning here and see how they can be used to answer questions about interesting data sets. Um, I believe that you should have received uh, information from your lab TA about uh, project one partners. You can work um, with a partner in your same lab. Um, this week's lab, you will work on the project with your partner. So we would uh, definitely strongly encourage you go to lab and you can meet up with your partner there and work on the, the project together. Um, we recommend that you work on the project together. We think that pair programming and pa working together in pairs is a great way to learn the material. What I don't recommend you do is that you split up the project. One person says, I'll do the first half. The other person says, I'll do the other half. You're really missing out on a learning opportunity there. I think doing the problems together in real time uh, with a, you know, a Zoom call up with your sharing your screen is a really get, great way to like talk through how you're going to approach it and learn and, and learn from each other. Uh, the full project will be due October 2nd. So the checkpoint is due this Friday. I apologize, I didn't post the slides on the course webpage. So I'll do that after lecture. Um, all right, so uh, today we're gonna talk about uh, um, how to do a uh, group and pivot and join. Um, all right, so um, let me talk you through well, that's, that's gonna be soon. And then I'll tell you on Wednesday, we've been doing a lot of material and coding and on tables and um, we're wrapping that up. So on Wednesday, we're gonna walk through a larger case study using all these techniques you learn for manipulating tables. And then on Friday, we're gonna start some new material. We're going to start looking at um, randomization. We're going to look at iteration, how to write um, uh, for loops in code and, and how to simulate, simulate uh, random experiments. Okay, so I want to start with um, uh, teaching uh, about lists in Python. We've been working with arrays and lists are a lot like arrays, but they're a little different. So there's a list. And um, a list is like an array, it's a sequence of values. Um, what makes lists different than arrays? Uh, arrays have to have the same type. Everything in the array has to have the same type. But in a list, it doesn't all have to be the same type. You could have a string and you could have um, a number. And that's okay. All right. So, uh, uh, very similar, very similar to arrays, but the key difference is that a list um, can have different types. I also want to mention, here's a, here's a slightly tricky bit. You can nest these things. You can put uh, numbers in a list, or one thing you can put in a list is an array or another list. All right. So for instance, um, uh, here is a list. The way you write a list in Python is with square brackets. The square brackets there denote that um, everything in there is a list and the items of the list are separated by commas. So you can see this is a list because there's a, it starts with a square bracket and ends with a square bracket. Okay, the first item in this list is the number five. You could tell that because the comma indicates the separation between the items in the list. Python will treat this as an expression and evaluate it and stick the result in the list. The next item in the list is 
not the number four, it's text, it's a string. And then the third item in this list, well, again, everything, everything here is just this complicated expression, which Python's gonna evaluate and stick the result of that into the list. So what is happening in this complicated expression over here? This complicated expression is creating a table. And then um, it adds one column to that table. So we have here a list that has three items, a number, a string, and a table. Okay, so why am I teaching about lists? Why do you care about lists versus arrays? Um, in a lot of circumstances, they're more or less interchangeable. Um, but uh, arrays are natural for holding columns because everything in the one column of a, of a table should have the same type. Lists are natural for holding rows because um, the types of the things in each row might be different. Um, if you, um, uh, if you, you can use a list to specify a column and it'll be auto converted to an array by our methods. And lists can contain things other than numbers, they contain strings, they contain tables, they can even contain other lists. So here would be an example. Um, here's an example of uh, a list that contains a string, a number, a float, and um, a Boolean. Uh, you could have um, a list that contains an array. All right. So there we've created a list. It has one item. The item is an array. All right, so you can tell it's a list. That's what this, Python is indicating that with the square brackets. And I could have multiple things in here. I could have some numbers in there. I could have the array. And there is a list with four items. One of the items is an array. All right, here's a table. I can um, uh, create a table and specify some uh, labels, but not put any data in it by using a, 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 a list of the column labels. And then I can add some rows to this table. So this starts out as an empty table. And then the dot with rows, it's kind of like dot with columns, but now it's rather than adding a column, it's adding a row. And so um, if I uh, use this code, then it's added four rows. And you can see that dot, uh, the dot with rows, what did I pass as the argument? I passed a list, you can see these square brackets. It's a list. What's in that list? Other lists are in there. So what I passed to dot with rows is a list of rows. How do I represent a row? Well, each line here represents a row. And I represent a row with another list, a nested list. I heard you like lists, so I put a list in your list. All right. So you can see here, here was a, the first row was entered with this first list that has um, uh, the data in the first column, the data in the second column, data in the third column. All right, so that's lists and how we uh, use them. Uh, yeah, I renamed drinks. Um, uh, why did I assign this to drinks? Well, because um, drinks.withrows creates a new table but doesn't modify the existing one. And I wanted to now um, refer to this new table with extra rows, so I needed to give it a name. And I reused the same name as before, which is maybe a little confusing. It might be better to give it a new name, but that's what I did. Okay, columns. Yes, columns are still considered arrays. Um, uh, definitely. What would happen if I didn't nest the list and simply remove the first set of brackets? Uh, try it. Uh, Yanai posted a uh, link to the demos. You can click on that and open up in your notebook and try, try making these changes. I definitely encourage you to play around with and try this stuff. It's a, it can be very helpful. This is a good, good thing to learn how to do when you're not sure what it's, what the interpreter is going to do in some strange situation uh, type it in and, and try it, make that change. Okay. Uh, let's move on. So what I want to uh, teach you a little bit now is about uh, cross classification. So last lecture you learned about the group operation. The group operation is really useful if you have a categorical variable and you want to understand its distribution. You can visualize that categorical variable with a histogram or you can count the number of, of each type of value. Sorry, you can visualize with a bar chart. 
if you want a visualization, or if you want to see the exact numbers instead of just a length of a bar, you can create a table that has those exact numbers uh, using the group operation. That's if you had one categorical variable you want to know the distribution of. But sometimes we want to know the relationship between two categorical variables. We want to, for instance, understand is there an association between these two variables? And cross classification involves having two categorical variables, and I want to count how many people there are with, with any possible combination of those two categorical variables. All right. So, for instance, maybe I care about uh, both the political party you're registered for and um, um, whether you live in an urban or a rural area. There's two different variables and maybe I want to count the number of combinations of each. How many Democrats there are who live in rural areas, how many Republicans in rural areas and so on. That would be an example of cross classification. All right, so um, one way you can do that is with the group operation. There's a way you can use the group operation to look at combinations of columns. All right, so let me show you how that's going to work. Uh, you're going to call uh, the group operation. And the first argument is going to be a list of the columns, the, all those uh, variables that I care about. For instance, it might be a uh, registered political party and um, uh, uh, location. All right. So that'd be a list of two columns. And then um, you can optionally provide a, a way to aggregate. By default, what this will do is count the number of people in each combination. But if you instead wanted to know something else about those people, there's a, you can provide a different way to do aggregation. And I think the best way to show you that is with an example. So um, let's do an example. All right, so we're gonna work with uh, the results of the welcome survey that you filled in in homework one. And uh, there were a variety of different um, columns in there. But one that I thought was interesting was um, looked at, you told us what position you slept on and also whether you are a left-handed or right-handed. So I got curious, I was wondering, um, for those of you who sleep on your side, does which side you sleep on depend on whether you're right-handed or left-handed? Like maybe if you're right-handed, you sleep on your left side and if you're left-handed, you sleep on your right side or something, could that be? So to try to answer that question, um, I'm going to use the group operation. I use the group operation. The first argument that I pass here is a list of the two columns that I care about. Handedness and what position you sleep in. And that creates a table here. And you can see here that it's got each row corresponds to a combination of those two. Okay. So for instance, here is a row, the highlighted row is uh, all the people who responded to the survey and said they were left-handed and said they sleep on their back. And the third column has a count of many, how many people uh, have responded in that way. All right. Can I scroll up one more time, one more time? There's the group. Good, all right, here's the table, here's the result. You can see in red here, there's some warning message and uh, I apologize about that. You can ignore that, I think that Oops, we didn't update our libraries uh, to deal with the, some changes in the latest version of Python. So just go ahead and ignore this message. I'm sorry for the unsightly uh, message. Um, could I have done group without the brackets? No, I need the brackets because group is going to look, the first argument is going to be one column or a list of columns that would do the group. Does the order of the grouping matter like the elements in this list? No, I'm looking at combinations. So it's just a matter of only affects kind of what the order they're displayed in. What does show do? It displays the entire table. If I didn't have a show, then it would have only shown me the first five lines or so, but I wanted to see this whole table. So now we can look at this table and let me ask you, you can post your answers in the chat. Um, what do you think? Do you think there's an association between people who sleep on their side, whether they sleep on the same side as their handedness or the opposite side of their handedness? I'm seeing a lot of no's. I'm seeing a couple very weak or very slight association. Not really, not so much. 
A little bit of yes. All right, I'm with you. I'm with you. Where would we look at this table to try to form an opinion? Well, for left-handed people, we could look at how many sleep on their left side versus their right side. That's kind of 28 versus 28. Wow, that seems exactly even. And for right-handed people, we could look at how many sleep on their left side versus their right side, 310 versus 394. Okay, maybe there's a difference there. So um, if you said no, no association, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be okay with that. You know, it's looking like nothing for left-handed people and right-handed people, maybe it's very weak. And that might just be, you know, kind of random noise. You ask a bunch of people a question and you're getting a random sample and not everyone responded. And so maybe, you know, maybe there's some, some statistical fluctuation in happening there. There's not any real, any real difference. So I'd be okay with that. Or for those of you who said there might be a weak association, I'm also comfortable with that. You can see here, there is some difference. The right-handed people, maybe slightly more of them sleep on the right side than the left side. So maybe it's possible. There's a little bit of a connection here. It could be that people are slightly more likely to sleep on their, the side of their dominant hand. I don't know. Okay. But it doesn't seem super strong. It's not like I was imagining that you sleep on the side opposite to your dominant hand always or something like that. All right. So this would be an example of cross-classification. And what we're doing here is cross-classification is useful when we want to look for uh, trying to get an idea whether there's an association between two categorical variables. And the way we do that is with this, with this table of uh, counts of each combination. All right. Yeah, and someone points out it was hard for them to answer because they sleep on all sides. So the data here is not going to be perfect, right? There's going to be some there's going to be some imperfection because I tried to summarize people into these four categories. And the truth is there's more variety in the world than just these four categories. Um, we feed in a list for the first argument of group. Um, why is it a list? Uh, you know, I need to provide multiple columns. You could actually uh, provide uh, three here or four, and it would do all combinations of those three or those four, any number you want but those all have to go into the first argument to group. So the way we do that, this is just how we define the group operation. There's nothing fundamental about that. This is just the way you call that particular operation. All right, so um, uh, that's grouping with multiple columns is one way to do cross-classification. But you might have noticed in that it was a little bit unsightly that we had a lot of rows in this table and it was a little bit painful to look at. So here's another way to do it that produces a result that might be easier for you to look at. It's called pivot tables. And instead of having a one dimensional table, we have a two dimensional table. So pivoting again, we're doing the same thing or cross classifying against two categories. We're gonna to try to count how many people are in each combination. Um, and, but now we're gonna do it with a grid. So each combination is gonna be in a different location in this grid. And um, vertically, the rows are gonna to correspond to the value of one categorical variable and, and well, that was horizontally, wasn't it? Uh, that was vertically, that was vertically. And then horizontally, the values of the other uh, variable are gonna determine where you are horizontally, okay? So I uh, would do this with the pivot operation. And um, there's two arguments to the pivot operation. Um, uh, the first argument is um, uh, the, the, the labels of the, the columns. And the second is um, um, gonna, uh, is the variable that uh, determines the rows, all right? So you pass two arguments, which are the two variables you wanna, you're looking for an association between, you wanna do cross classification with. And then as we'll see in a moment, you can optionally add uh, two more arguments. Uh, by default, the pivot operation will uh, count how many people there are in each combination, but you'll see in a moment, we can um, uh, do things other than count. So yeah, this is kind of like a scatter plot version Kind of like a, a, a looks, reminds you a lot of scatter plot, doesn't it? Scatter plot is useful when you want to look for an association between two numerical variables. Pivot tables are useful when you want to look for an association between two categorical variables. Okay. Categorical variables, um, tables are really useful. Numerical variables, plots are really useful. All right, so let's do the same question we were looking at before about the relationship between which side you sleep on and um, your dominant hand. But uh, now we're gonna do it with a pivot table instead of with group. So I called pivot and I told it the names of the two uh, columns that I'm interested in. And it produced this table right here. So you can see now I got a 2D grid um, and each combination corresponds to a different location in this grid. And 
for some purposes, this is a little bit easier to look at. For instance, uh, do I want to know whether left-handed people are more likely to sleep on the left side or the right side? Well, I can compare these two variables. They're right next to each other. And for the right-handed people, it's these two that are right next to each other. Or for people who sleep on the left side, I want to compare left-handed versus right-handed. I look up and down. So, so in some, some kinds of comparisons are a lot easier with this kind of a 2D grid instead of having to jump around in that table I got from group. Why don't I need to take in the arguments as an array this time? It's just how the pivot operation is defined. Why did the why did it uh, get defined this way? Well, uh, pivoting is a 2D table, so it only makes sense for looking at associations between exactly two variables. Whereas group, you can group by combinations of one variable, two variables, three variables, four variables, any number of variables. And so a list is natural. There's no fixed number that are going to be there. But it's always going to be two for, for the pivot operation. Anyway, it's not that important. It's just something to memorize. There's nothing fundamental here about this. And if you forget, you look it up in our Python reference. You can find a link under the resources on our course webpage. So it's, it's no big deal. All right, so this is a, shows you counts. But suppose I wanted, what I want to do is, is not just count the number of people in each combination, but know something about that group of people in that combination. Instead of just knowing how many people are left-handed and sleep on their left side, maybe I want to summarize that group in some other way than how many people are there in that group, okay? So this is called aggregation, and it's a more sophisticated form of aggregation than just a count, all right? So um, uh, what you can do is you can specify an, a, a function which um, uh, describes how to summarize a group of people or a group of rows. And we've been summarizing a group by a, a combination um, by just counting how many people, how many rows are in that. But we saw previously the group operation allows you to specify this collect argument. And this collect argument will summarize people uh, by averaging them. So everyone in that combination, it'll, it'll produce an average. And um, so if we apply this to uh, the survey, you get this fairly interesting and complicated looking table. And what it did is it uh, grouped the rows by what position they sleep on. So we have uh, here, this highlighted row corresponds to everyone who answered the survey and said they sleep on their left-hand side. And then we have here for each other column in the original table, we've summarized the average value of that column for people who sleep on their left-hand side. So for instance, people who slept on the left-hand side have an average of text on average 6.9 people each day. And they get on average 7.15 hours of sleep. So for instance, maybe you'd be wondering, this is kind of interesting. I wonder whether there's an association between what side you, how you sleep on, where you, like how you sleep, and how many hours of sleep you get. Well, we could look at that by looking at this column, hours of sleep, the average numbers of hours of sleep. Do people who sleep on their back sleep, get more hours of sleep than people who sleep on their stomach? No. If anything, it's people who sleep on their right-hand side who in the survey reporting getting a little bit more, uh, a little bit more sleep. So you might say there's a very weak association between your sleeping position and how many hours of sleep you get. Or you might say, ah, these numbers are, these differences are so small that it could just be random variation and maybe it's, there's nothing real happening here. That's also possible. Okay. So for instance, what we just did here was we looked at the association between a categorical variable, sleeping position, and a numerical variable, number of hours of sleep you get. Can we add handedness to this? That's a great question. Let's do that next. So um, suppose that now we, um, I, I'm going to care, suppose that I want to know about the number of hours of sleep, and I want to know who gets the most hours of sleep, and now I care not only about how you sleep, but also which is your dominant hand. All right, so I'm going to keep only those three columns from the table, and then I'm going to group by the combination of your dominant hand and what position you sleep in. And then for each combination, that's some, some, some of you who answered, for instance, that you're left-handed and you sleep on your back, among those people uh, report the average numbers of hours of sleep. All right, so the way we did that is we specified this collect equals argument that says, summarize a bunch of people by the average value. And the group operation said, combine them, combine them into groups, break them up into groups, 
by put people in the same group if they have the same value of handedness and the same value of sleep position. All right, so now we can look through and you can say who gets the most sleep uh, left handers or sleep on their left side and who gets the least uh, people who are um, uh, use both hands and sleep on their stomach. Now, I should caution you, you should not believe these numbers at all because these are categories with very few respondents. And so, you know, all maybe there's only one person who uses both hands and sleep on their stomach. And if that one person just happens to not get much sleep, then you might end up with a very low average. So it doesn't actually mean that if you um, are, are by-handed and you decide to sleep on your stomach, you're doomed to not getting enough sleep for the rest of your life. Okay, so be very careful about um, uh, whether these associations are real, especially when we're breaking down into very small groups with very few respondents, then, then just random chance or, or happenstance about one particular individual who happens to be in that group can really dominate the results. Do you need to put collect equals NP average? You could try it, try it on your, on your demo. Um, you can actually leave it out um, and it will figure out that you mean to use collect equals, but I like to always specify that this is an aggregation function by um, uh, using a named argument, um, collect equals. And that is a reminder to me when I read this code, what is that argument doing? What is the meaning of that argument? Oh yeah, that's how to, that's how to aggregate the values is by average. Uh, what's the meaning of dot show? It shows the whole table. Normally the notebook will show only the first five rows of the table to avoid overwhelming you. But in this case, I wanna see all the rows and I know I'm not gonna get overwhelmed. So I use dot show. If I don't put collect, then what happens? Well, let's try it. Uh, a lot of these questions, this is great. Open up the demos and see what happens yourself. Um, but I'll, tr I'll show you how you could try it. You remove that, rerun the cell, and what happens? It no longer showed me the average. It showed me the count of the number of people in each of those combinations. So for instance, there was only one person who had both used both hands and sleeps on their stomach. All right, so we put that back in. And now I see it shows me the average. All right. Um, you can also use pivot tables with this aggregation. So let me show you how to do that. Uh, we made a pivot table here and we're gonna do the same thing, but now instead of this unwieldy uh, stuff where these combinations, each combination is a separate row, we're gonna put them in a 2D grid. So these are the same numbers we just got, but now put organized into a 2D grid, much nicer to look at, I think. And so what I did here was I specified um, the two variables that determine um, uh, the the, the, the columns and the rows you're in, that's the structure of the grid. Then the next, this values equal, determines um, which numerical, in this case, numerical variable that I, I care about summarizing. And then uh, the very last part, this collect equal says how to summarize the people in a group. What, what operation, what, what function should I use on all the people who are in that group? So you can use any uh, function you know, you know of here, you could use the max or the min or the average, or um, we've been using the count before, but uh, if you don't specify anything, but this allows me to specify the average. So this is showing me the number of hours of sleep for each combination. What makes this a 2D grid? Uh, the pivot operation gives you a 2D grid. Group gives you kind of a 1D thing. Uh, pivot gives you a 2D thing. That's the main reason why we use pivot. Now, um, you have to, if you specify um, one of these optional arguments, you have to specify both. If I tell it that um, I want to know about uh, combinations of sleep position and handedness, and I want to summarize them using the hours of sleep, but I don't provide a collect argument, it gives me an error um, because it doesn't know how to take a bunch of numbers for all the people who fall into one cell and then how to summarize those bunch of numbers as a single number. So I need to tell it, you should summarize all those numbers by taking their average. Okay, so this 7.457 was obtained by looking at all the people who answer they're left-handed and sleep on their left-hand side. I got a bunch of numbers from them, which is their reported number of hours of sleep for each of the people who fall into that, that, uh, that, that combination into that group. And then I summarize all those numbers by taking their average and reporting that single number here in the cell. Oh. All right, so values does not determine the left-hand column or the right-hand column or the, or the, or the like, the rows or the, or the columns, it determines what numbers show up in each cell of the pivot table. Why didn't I have to type values equals for the other examples? Well, because with this other example of pivot tables, what is 
what's showing up here in each cell is a count. Um, and so it's not really relating to the values of any columns at all. It's just a count of how many people are reported they were left-handed asleep on their left-hand side. So there was no other column to, to try to identify. Okay, so this is the group operation and the pivot operation. So now I wanted you to try applying this. I want you to try it. Um, here is a challenge question. Um, we have a table here with a bunch of skyscrapers, a bunch of old um, uh, skyscrapers and a bunch of cities. And you can see a city column and build of different materials. And I want you to um, answer, think for me for a moment, think, take a moment to think about what operations would you use to find the height of the tallest building for each material. So like, you know, like the height of the tallest concrete building, the height of the tallest steel one. Think about what table operations you could use to do that. And then leave me a chat message with how you would do that. The name of this table is sky. So write me some code, sky dot what? Yes. Yes. I love it. Oh, so much good stuff you're sending me. And you know what I love? I really love that you took the time to try to write out some code and commit to an answer. Man, that is so key to learning, I think. I think that is so helpful. Even if your answer, whether your answer turns out to be right or not, um, this process of let me try to come up with it myself and then let me compare it to the right answer, um, I think is really, really useful. It's, it's the number one most helpful way to avoid fooling ourselves into thinking, I know how to do this. This all makes sense to me. And then getting stuck when you actually have to do it. So good job. I love the answers I'm seeing. They're really good stuff. I'm seeing some pivot and I'm seeing some group. So let's figure out how we choose between group and pivot. I think pivot would be useful if I wanted to know about like some 2D grid that was, let's say both material and city. But in this case, I want to do just the material and I don't care what city it's in. So I'm kind of hoping maybe I'd like to get a table, maybe with like one row or one column per material. So there's kind of only one, one variable that I'm using to, to clump up things into a group. I'm grouping together all the skyscrapers that are made of concrete, grouping together all the ones that are made of steel. So I'm, I'm grouping by material. So, so first off, I would say everyone who said use the dot group operation, good stuff, great. I can see why you said pivot, but actually in this case, I think group is appropriate. And then I see a lot of people saying dot group. And uh, then there's some debate about should I use, um, what do I group by? Do I group by one column or by two? Do I group by material column or do I group by material and height or by material and city? Well, those would each do different things. In this case, I think we wanna group by material. We wanna create a group of all the skyscrapers that are concrete. And then we wanna summarize that group where we wanna aggregate all the skyscrapers in that group is by taking the one with the max height. All right, so let's go do a look at a solution now. Here is this table. This time I got your table. I showed you a table with only five rows on the slides, but actually there's a table with almost 2000 different skyscrapers. And, um, 
All right. Um, let me remind myself. Oh, dear. I was just talking about, ah, everything I said was wrong. I forgot that I said for each city and each material. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. So I want to actually look at combinations of material and city. Ah, so uh, uh, dot group. If I want to group, I want to group by probably both the city and the material. All right. Good. So I take back everything I just said. <laughs> I want to do it again and say, uh, yeah, you could use either group or pivot. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I would have gotten this one wrong. <laughs> Oops. All right. F, F on this mini quiz for me and uh, A for a lot of you. All right. So I think you want to group. If you're using the group operation, if you said use the group operation, you want to group by both the city and the material because I want to put together all the skyscrapers that are from Atlanta and that are concrete, for instance. And then I want to summarize them. The aggregation operation I want to do is I want to summarize them by taking the maximum of the height. So the collect operation is going to be max. I'm going to use the max. And in this case, I decided I really only, I don't care about anything other than the city, the material, and the height. It's the max of the height that I want. So I'm going to do a select operation to keep only those three, um, three columns that I care about, group by city and material, collect, and that will show me um, the max height. All right, so you can see here for each combination of city and material, it shows um, the highest, the height of the highest skyscraper. You don't have to write collect equals, you could just write max. Um, I like writing collect equals because it reminds me what the meaning of that max is and what role it's playing. How does it know to take the max of the height? It's because those are the only three columns. It groups by city and material, and then it'll take the max of each every th other thing, each other column that remains. So for instance, suppose I didn't do that select. Suppose I just did this. Well, then I would get a table like this and it tries to do the max of every other column. So I could look here at this height max and that's useful. The age max, I didn't care about. So why is that included? And the name max, what does that even mean? That's crazy. So that's why I stuck in this. All right, so if you left that out, I, you know, good enough. This is, I'm cleaning up the answer a little bit to avoid having stuff, irrelevant uh, information in the answer. Could you do it using pivot? You could totally do it using pivot. All right, so those of you who said pivot, also good. Maybe even nicer, because here we have one row per combination. Maybe you'd like to have a 2D grid with one row per material and a, and a column per city. And the way you could do that is if you tell pivot, I want material and city as my two as my two, um, two variables. And then the summarization I want to do is not count how many there are in each combination, but find the max height. So the pivot operation says, uh, uh, in each combination, I care about the height and the collect, the aggregation I want to do is the max. All right, so here we go. We got it now organized in 2D form. So for Atlanta, steel skyscrapers, the highest is 169.47. All right, so I saw a lot of good answers in your answers. If this is what you had, great. If you had something a little different, then now you can compare what you came up with and what this answer was and, um, and see whether there's something you could learn from that. How do we get the name of the building? Oh, that's a little more painful <laughs> in this case. It's not just one line of code. All right, I'm gonna skip over the next challenge question. Um, if you wanna try it on your home, uh, this is a more challenging one. Um, think about for each city, What's the age difference between the oldest steel and the oldest concrete building? This is a nice question because you might have to do multiple operations. You know, not just enough to do just one collect or one group or one, one pivot. So um, sometimes um, we will like group by something and then the result is a table and then we could do some more operations than the result of that. So when you're wandering around today, you can think about um, how to solve this second question, age difference between oldest steel and oldest concrete for each city. And if that's not challenging enough, here's a follow-up you can try. You can come back and look at the slides. If you like a little practice, here's one we think is a good one. This is challenging. All right. All right, so um, let me summarize what I talked about with group and pivot. How can you verify your answer? You can go um, uh, open up the demos notebook, which I'll link in the course webpage after this lecture, and then you can try it. You can type your code in and see if it works. 
So I've taught you about grouping and I've taught you about pivoting, um, which are different ways of doing um, a cross classification. So let me just give you a summary of when to use them. If you want to know the distribution of a single categorical variable, use dot group. If you want to do cross classification, you've got two or more categorical variables, you're looking for an association between them. You might be using group or you might be using pivot. Oftentimes you can use either one. If you want to have one row per combination, use dot group. If you want to have one variable shown vertically and one shown horizontally, so there's 2D grid, use pivot. All right. So if you've got two categorical variables, you could use either pivot or group. It's just a preference of the format, how you want it to be shown up. If you've got three or more categorical variables, um, you're probably going to have to use group because we can't show you a 3D table. Um, all right. So I think that's enough on pivot and groups. I want to show you about joins. Uh, join is another operation that's useful. So far, we've been working with a single table. But often, in the real world, you'll find your data is split across multiple spreadsheets or multiple databases or multiple tables. Maybe you got some data from one source, and you got other data from another source. And now you want to hook the two up. Well, a join is one kind of a combination, one kind of an operation you can do that um, draws connections between two different tables. So here I've got an example where I've got one table that has uh, menu items, uh, different drinks you can get at different um, coffee houses around Berkeley. And it'll show for each which kind of drink you can get at that, at that cafe and what the cost is for that drink. And then I've got another table of some coupons that I have. For each coupon gives me a percentage off at one of these coffee houses. I have multiple coupons. So now I might want to uh, put these two sources of data together and find out some stuff that relates to both. All right, so now we need something new because all of our operations so far act on only a single table. So for instance, maybe I want to find out like what are all my options for what kind of drinks I could get and what the cost will be taking into account the coupons that I got. All right, so now I'm going to have to pull from both of those tables and I want to create a new table that's kind of like the left hand one but shows me the dis discounted price. All right, so uh, the join operation is going to help me do that. The join operation will let me create a new table that has uh, data from both of those and where they get hooked up. See, um, you know, not every row in the drinks table is, is relevant to every row in the coupons table. There's, there's, some, there's some relationship. If they come from the same, they have the same coffee shop, then they're related. So knowing there's a milk tea, I don't know, an espresso at Strata is useful because I have a coupon at Strata. So I'd like to hook up this espresso at Strata row from the drinks table with the 25% off at strata row from the coupons table. So the join operation creates me a new table that has, um, um, that, that looks at all ways of, of combining, take a row from the drinks table and a row from the discounts table, but only if they're relevant, if they relate to the same coffee house. All right. So I we say that I do a join on this cafe column that they have a column that's in common. They name differently in this case, but it's really the same column. It's, it's the same, same information in column in co that's in common to both of these tables. And I'm going to hook them up based on finding rows that have the same value for this coffee house part. All right. Well, the way I can do that is with this, uh, the following Python code. I call the join operation on the drinks table. And I tell it it's the cafe column that has that, that column in common. And I also tell it, I want you, to, want you to combine that with the discounts table. And over there, the name of the column is the location. But it's the same data. All right. And that's going to produce the table on the right. So what's going on here? You see this, this uh, coffee house. Uh, column here. That's what we did the join on. And you can kind of think of it as like one row 
from the drinks table, for each row from the drinks table, we put a row in this resulting table with all of the, of the, um, the data from the original drinks table, but a new column, this coupon column has been added. This new coupon column is taken from the discounts table. So at Asha, we have um, um, uh, 10 percent off at strata we have 20 25 percent off so that's how this coupon column got filled in it got filled in from the discounts table by matching up um, finding the appropriate row in the discounts table based on the location based on the coffee house but there's something funny happening you'll notice that um, some of these rows in the drinks tables got duplicated for instance the the milk tea at asha row there's now two of those rows in the result of the join operation. Why is that? It's because we have two coupons for Asha. We have a 10% off and we have a 5% off. So the join operation said there's two ways I could combine them. So let me duplicate and show you each combination. For the Strata Espresso at Strata, there was only one coupon we had for that. So that there's only one row over here. And finally, the um, Espresso at the uh, Free Speech Movement Cafe, we don't have any coupons for that. So there was nothing to match it up again. There's no way to fill in the, the coupon column. So there were no, that, that, that row just disappeared. It doesn't appear in the output. Okay, so it only shows data where we have a match where the coffee, the cafe column has a row in the drinks table and it also has one in the discounts table. And then, um, and then it'll hook those two rows up based on the matching value in the cafe column. So location here in the discounts table is just, you should think of it as that cafe column. It just happens to have a different name. All right, that's the join operation. So we're matching based on the value of the cafe column. And uh, this is, uh, you, can, you can see here how things get combined. Each, we take a row from the drinks table, a row from the discounts table, and that put them together and that gives me a row in the output. But we only do that if they match in the cafe column. If the cafe column of the drinks table matches the location in the discounts. Otherwise, we don't. Okay. All right, so that's the join operation. So let me show you it in action here. Um, here, I'm gonna create, there I have the drinks table and I'm going to create the discounts table. So this is just the tables I showed you in the slides. And then I do the join operation I showed you in the slides and we get the result that I showed you. And now maybe what I care about, I said the original question was I wanted to know what's the cost of each drink taking into account the discounts that I got. All right. So I have all the data I need, but I need to put that together. So this, this table that comes out of the join shows me both the price and the the percentage off, but I really want to know what the discounted price will be after I take off the amount from my coupon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new column. Okay, I'm going to take um, uh, this 5.5, and I need to multiply that by um, 0.9 because it's it's I'm taking 10% off. I'm taking 0.1 of it off as the discount. Right. So take the take the the percentage off, convert that to a fraction, subtract one minus that. That's going to give me 0.9 here. And then I need to multiply that by the undiscounted price. And that will give me the discounted price. So now I've got an array that I'm going to add as a new column here. And I've got the discounted pr price for each uh, drink that I could get at each cafe. And now there's my new menu. All right. So this is how I can put together data from two different tables. And it gives me a new table that has information from both. And then I can do any operations I want once I got it in one table. So if you got data from multiple sources, sources, use the join to get it into one table and then do whatever operations you need to do on that one table. Uh, last, just a little bit of a, of a, of a weirdness. Um, what happens if I have um, the same um, column label in both of these tables? What does it do? Well, it renames the column from the second um, uh, table with, by adding an underscore to. All right, so 
uh, you'll just see that if you ever have a, a, a duplicated column uh, label, you'll know um, that the underscore two comes from the second table. All right, so we're out of time. Um, what I've shown you today is I've shown you um, the group and the pivot operations, how to use them for cross classification, which is very useful if you want to look for an associations between categorical variables. I've also shown you how to do the join operation, which is useful when you're combining data from multiple tables. And on Wednesday, I will then um, show you a case study. We've started to learn a language, um, a, a bunch of building blocks for working with data. And we'll now try to do some more ambitious data analysis tasks so you can see how this might be applied in practice to, to look at a rich data set and gain some understanding about what it's showing us. All right, go to discussion section, do your vitamin, um, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>